minutes uh, uh, that we give people an opportunity to join. We are mindful that some people are coming from other engagements. So we'll give it another minute or two and then we'll move over to our agenda for, to get through to. My name is Sizulu Moyo and I'm from the Human Sciences Research Council. I'll help to facilitate and chair this session today. We're very grateful to have you uh, this afternoon. As I've said before, we're very aware that you've got other competing priorities, but we trust that um, our engagement this evening will be very useful. So just a few ground rules. I think the webinar is set up in the usual way that uh, you know webinars are set up. There is a, a, a function where you may type your, your questions if they come along, especially given that sometimes we do run out of time. We'll try and make sure that we stick to time to have um, time to deal with questions, but you can put them in the chat as the webinar progresses so that uh, some of the panelists or others can um, respond to them. So this webinar is taking place a month, uh, exactly a month before World TB Day 2022. And as we know, TB is one of the major public health burdens in South Africa. The reason why I'm mentioning World TB Day is that every year on the 24th of March, we commemorate World TB Day to raise public awareness about this uh, devastating health um, impact and also the social and economic uh, consequences of TB, and also to step up efforts uh, in addressing this global epidemic. We hope that as we discuss today, we can also make our contribution uh, towards that objective. Just a few steps that I'm sure all of us know that in, in 2022, in South Africa, about 61,000 people died from TB. Uh, we know that 31,000 of those were HIV positive, but this is an increase from what we had in 2019, where it was 58,000 uh, people who lost their lives to TB. And we know that one life lost is one life uh, too many. So this evening, we are part in particular focusing on care of TB in the private sector. We're very grateful and thankful to have uh, presenters who will present on the South African experience. We're also very privileged to have representation from a key global stakeholder. We've got somebody from the Stop TB Partnership who will also give a presentation this evening. We are also privileged to have a panel uh, representing key national stakeholders and custodians of care. And I think TB care in South Africa from the private sector to the TB think tank and also to uh, national, provincial and also district representatives. So we've got a widespread uh, of people to hear from, people who have got a stake uh, in this topic uh, of TB. So we're mindful that the program of the time and that we've got a program that is full. And that, as I have said, I will endeavor to stick uh, to the time so that we can uh, move on to the other things that we, we need to, to be doing. I do hope that you can hear me. Uh, if there's any problem, please, you may raise your hand and our IT colleagues will be able to assist. So without much further ado, I will um, move on to introduce our, our presenters. We have got um, five presenters and they each will present for 10 minutes. After that presentation, we'll move quickly to our panelists. Uh, I'll introduce them uh, and they can also say a bit more about themselves just before they speak. So our first presenter is um, Angie Salmon. She's a public health researcher and a medical student at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. She received a Master's of Public Health from the University of Toronto in 2018, and has more recently worked with the McGill International Tuberculosis Center on a study that examined the quality of care amongst general practitioners here in South Africa. So it was in Durban and in Cape Town. She is interested in primary care in low resource settings, uh, and working with diverse and marginalized populations. She is extremely grateful to have the opportunity to present um, her research findings to us uh, this evening. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to you, Angie. Thank you so much, Dr. Moyo, and thank you everybody for being here today. It's lovely to see some familiar faces and to meet many new ones. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen. I think we got this to work last time. 
Um, so if I do like this, you just see my uh, presentation, correct? Is that good? Yes. All right. Okay, okay. Yes. thank you so much. Okay, so uh, good evening, uh, good morning for me. It's 10 o'clock in the morning for me here, but um, it's my immense pleasure to and privilege to be speaking to you all today from Canada. Um, we're really demonstrating the good things to come from this pandemic, the, the surge of uh, virtual presentation and webinars. So I'm gonna share results today from a study uh, led by the Human Sciences Research Council and the McGill International TB Center on prescribing practices for TB-like symptoms in South Africa. And this research was recently published in BMJ Global Health. So please feel free to access this or ask me uh, to send you a copy of the full article if you're interested to learn more, I'd be happy to share the PDF. Our overarching goal of this project was to uh, describe the quality of care delivered by private GPs treating standardized patients uh, who present with tuberculosis symptoms and the piece that I'm going to discuss today is uh, more so on the prescribing practices, so the quantity and composition of medicines prescribed or dispensed. Very briefly, we use the standardized patient methodology, whereby we trained community actors uh, to portray one of three cases of TB to uh, GPs in the community. So case one had classic TB symptoms, a productive cough, fever, loss of appetite and weight, um, case two had the same symptoms and was uh, presented with actually a positive gene expert lab report, but was not yet started on anti-TB treatment. And case three had the same symptoms, but had a, a story of being previously but incompletely treated for TB. So our question for all of these patient interactions was how are these patients managed in private GP practices? Um, in total, we recruited 200 21 private GPs from various areas of Durban and Cape Town. We had 16 standardized patients to present as one of these three cases, some of whom are in the room today. Um, and we practiced and tested their recall skills. And then we collected data in two ways. The first was an exit survey following each interaction in which we documented the questions that were asked, the examinations performed, um, and any tests or referrals made by the GP. And the second was an artifact survey in which we documented all medicines and physical referral forms given to the patient. So one of the first things that we discovered was that standardized patients received a lot of medicine, so many that we opened up a new storage room for them in our offices in Durban. Um, this patient, for example, received eight separate medications from their one interaction. And that's not to say that more medicines is bad practice inherently, but I'm just showing this slide to give you an idea of the wealth of data we re received in the form of medications dispensed and the potential insight to be gained by exploring the contents of these boxes. Of course, medicines make huge positive contributions to disease prevention, alleviation, and treatment. But as we know as well, they can do harm. Overuse, underuse, misuse can compromise optimal disease management and lead to complications like adverse drug events, drug dependence, as well as increasing health system expenditures and antibiotic resistance in certain scenarios. Inappropriate medicine use can also pose unique problems for TB as they can mask symptoms crucial for diagnosis and lead to delays in testing diagnosis and confirmation of TB. So between August 2018 and July 2019, uh, 511 interactions were completed resulting in a total of 1,576 medicines. At least one medicine was prescribed in over 88% of interactions, and the median number of medicines per interaction was three. The vast remainder were dis uh, dispensed at the point of care rather than prescribed uh, for pickup at a later date or at a pharmacy, which facilitated their immediate use. We also saw that an injectable medication was offered in 32% of in interactions, the majority of which were not um, explained or documented, um, and the remainder um, it, it described as for influenza or cough or otherwise an antibiotic or a vitamin. The most common medications were antibiotics, which made up 27% of all medications prescribed or dispensed, 
followed by these more symptomatic treatments, such as cough remedies, uh, analgesics, antipyretics, such as paracetamol or paracetamol codeine combinations, um, and other sort of cold flu combinations meant to tackle the symptoms the patient was experiencing. Now, case two, which I described as the case with the confirmed TB, um, confirmed by gene expert uh, lab report, lab result, received significantly fewer antibiotics um, and steroids, but a higher proportion of these sort of symptomatic medicines, which I think makes sense. Um, and interestingly, patterns of medicines prescribed varied significantly by case and study site. For example, significantly more interactions, so this is now as a percent of interactions, more interactions involving either this typical or classic TB uh, or previous TB resulted in a medicine, so approaching 100% for, uh, for the classic TB, um, as well as an antibiotic um, and offer of an injection compared to those with confirmed TB, TB excuse me, which is uh, the orange bar here. And similarly, uh, we saw differences between the two regions, so significantly more interactions in Durban resulted in the provision of any medicine, an antibiotic, uh, a fluoroquinolone specifically, or uh, an injection compared with those in Cape Town. Examine antibiotic resistance as a potential negative outcome. We use the WHO AWARE framework, and um, I won't read these out loud, but essentially access is good, <laughs> watch is less good, or higher risk, and reserve and discourage are highest risk and most dangerous for um, uh, potential to induce antibiotic resistance or contribute to antibiotic resistance. And here we actually have some great news. So the vast majority of antibiotics pre prescribed were from the access category, meaning that they pose relatively low risk to antibiotic resistance. Only 12% of antibiotics were from the watch category, and this is compared to much higher rates observed in similar studies, up to 78% observed in China, 48% in India. Um, in, in, in similar sort of uh, context of private practice. Despite this, this doesn't mean that the antibiotics used are harmless. As I mentioned, antibiotic overuse can contribute to diagnostic delay for TB because they suppress uh, growth uh, of the virus um, or the bacteria, excuse me, but not entirely clear the infection. Thus, as you can imagine, um, can cause the patient to feel a little bit better for a bit, but then have their symptoms return, perhaps make their way to another GP down the road or in their community where the process might repeat. Um, and now all of a sudden we have a patient living with TB for uh, several months without, uh, without diagnosis and, and proper treatment. So given these potential harms, we endeavored to find out what was driving these high rates of antibiotic use. And it seemed that perhaps obviously it was linked with not identifying TB as the cause of these symptoms, um, or at least uh, not considering it to be the most likely cause. There were also some stark differences between study sites, which we discussed, which might point to some sort of geographical variance in practice or training or access to resources. Uh, we also found that the GP was um, less likely to prescribe antibiotics if they had verbally asked the SP to follow up with them if symptoms persisted uh, or worsened, which meant that they were perhaps using treatment as a method to diagnose. So for the, if the symptoms resolved with antibiotics, problem solved, um, it was probably community acquired pneumonia. If they didn't, well, then we start to think of other uh, less likely diagnoses. Um, and these ideas will be further uh, explored by um, Ms. Masa Chawe in the upcoming talk. So look out for that. So our, our six sort of uh, main conclusions, just to summarize what I've shown you today, um, antibiotic prescription is high for patients presenting with symptoms of TB. They have relatively low risk of antibiotic resistance. However, their use does risk uh, delaying TB uh, diagnosis. Further, the fluoroquinolone use, which was 12% in this study, relatively low compared to other uh, studies, but much higher than the South African public sector, for example, um, may also be contributing to fluoroquinolone resistant TB. And uh, antibiotics are most commonly used when the diagnosis is unclear or when symptoms closely mimic other lower respiratory tract infections. Prescribing practices in general also might have implications on healthcare expenditure. In this study, we found that the average consultation fee was 67 rand higher when a medicine was dispensed, which might mean that providers who regularly dispense high volumes of medications have an increased consultation fee in order to offset these costs. 
um, although this is sort of speculation, I guess. And uh, what we could not inclu include, at least from the survey, was why these practices occurred as they did. And I'm just wrapping up here. Um, we speculated that things I mentioned as diagnostic uncertainty, perhaps patient perceptions and demand, um, time pressures, uh, various geographic demographic drivers, including systems of referral and the relative strength of public private partnerships of the region could play a role. Um, and, uh, and these things I think will be, will be explored a little further in other presentations. So I will end and say thank you. I hope you enjoyed this presentation um, and that you're looking forward to hearing about some of the solutions to these challenges. And if you have questions, please do put them in the chat. I would be happy to respond or you could always send me an email. And thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Angie, for that wonderful presentation. And I think we're doing very well on time. So we'll move quickly on to, the, to our next presenter, uh, Zimasa. Uh, Zimasa Gawe has an honors, Gawe Chawe has an honors degree in psychology and sociology. She's currently completing the MPH at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She began her journey in TB research as a standardized patient uh, on the study that we, Angie just presented and she transitioned to a master's student involved in the qualitative component of the study. Today, what she'll be presenting to us is an amalgamation of the work that has been done uh, exploring GP practices with, using the theory of plant uh, behavior change. So over to you, Zimasa. You are muted, Zimasa. Thank you. Um, greetings, everybody. My name is Zimasa Chawe. Um, today, I'll be um, presenting on the private sector challenges to integrated TB care. Just to give you guys a, a, a background, um, based on what Angie has uh, said, um, on the primary study, 76% of the mystery patient visit resulted to the antibiotic prescription. So then to better understand this phenomenon, so we explored the private GP's perspectives about the initial treatment of TB symptoms with short course antibiotics and factors that may actually uh, prevent the private GPs on following the uh, um, and following the guidelines on the antibiotic use when the TB is suspected. So on the study, we did um, follow-up interviews <coughs> on the GPs who participated on the study. Um, we, from the, we selected 15 GPs, and then we used the super analysis um, to understand uh, the antibiotic prescription. And also we employed the theory of plant behavior to further understand that phenomenon. And then in terms of analysis, we used the thematic analysis um, uh, to code the interview transcripts. And then we uh, linked the concept of the theory of plant be behavior with the actual um, management. So this is the figure of the theory of plant behavior. Basically what the, the theory says is that um, people, they move from their beliefs to their intention and as well as the factors that might influence um, their behaviors. So those uh, may either be aligned or misaligned with their actual behavior. Um, these were, were, were the findings. So as you can see here, we've moved the subjective norm up. So basically the subjective norm is the national TP guideline which, which says that you should test before actually giving antibiotics. So what we found is that um, GPs were actually aware of this of these guidelines because whenever they were asked um, how they would manage TB-like symptoms, they would always say that they would always say that you should test before giving antibiotics. But however, what we figured out on the actual um, practice about 16 interactions out of 36 uh, interactions, GPs actually gave um, antibiotics, and only in seven interactions whereby they tested um, and, and, and actually sent for a TB test. So this was quite um, interesting, which then led us to the, this attitude that emerged, which says that um, 
Actually, TB is not a common respiratory tract infection, which they see. Um, <clears throat> resulting to GPs actually doing uh, both the test and, and, and uh, giving antibiotics. So this was the result of, of, of different things. And they said that they fear that they, they might be underlying infection or maybe they could um, test um, and, and then wait for the test while um, the patient is getting sicker. So they preferred to um, do both, sending a patient um, while um, or they preferred treating first uh, while the patient is waiting for the TB test. So to explain that, now we come to the other part of the theory of plant behavior, which is the perceived behavior control, which actually explains um, the, the, which actually explains the, the resources that a person, um, oh, let me just, sorry, let me just first explain the subjective norm. Actually a subjective, a subjective norm is um, what is, actually regarded as an acceptable behavior in the society or by one's peers. And then an attitude is actually what influences an individual. And then a perceived behavioral control, it is what um, it's resources that may either restrict or enable someone to actually do a certain behavior. So as I just said, now we had to look at what are the limiting factors that might lead doctors to actually uh, prescribe antibiotics to patients presenting with TB-like symptoms. So then we go to issues like access issues, like there are no point of care test. So to further explain this, uh, I will extend, I will further explain this in the following slides. So as I have shared that <clears throat> the subject, the issue of the subjective norm. So during the interviews, when the GPs were asked about um, treating uh, TB symptoms, it appeared on the data again and again that they would test first before sending um, uh, before giving patients antibiotics, meaning that they are aware of the guidelines and they intended to follow the guidelines. So coming to the attitudes, so they were also asked why would they um, prescribe antibiotics when TB is suspected? So one, um, some explained that they fear missing an underlying infection while they are waiting for the um, TB test. So in the midst of waiting, a patient might get worse, so they prefer to treat while they are still waiting for the results. So in that, in that, in, in that awaiting period, they will actually give uh, the broad spectrum antibiotics. So coming to the, the perceived behavior control, as I have explained that, um, the perceived behavior control are the factors that are limiting uh, the GPs to actually do what they intended to do. So what I found was that um, on the results was that GPs, they said that they are feeling pressure from the patient. You know, as the patients are paying for the services, they expect something tangible in return. So that actually shifts the GPs from, um, from the subjective norm. Um, and then, uh, However, that does not explain why they won't um, actually send the patient for test and only prescribing antibiotics. Another issue was um, the access issues. So GPs have shared, have shared that they have limited resources on site to test for TB and other infections. And the other thing is that patients cannot afford um, TB tests. So, in conclusion, um, is, I, I, I found that um, GPs were aware of the guidelines and they, they intended to follow the guidelines. However, they, they limit having a, a limit, um, having limited resources on site is prohibiting, is prohibiting them to actually following through the guidelines. Another thing is that the pressure that they, 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 they feel um, and the fear that they will miss a certain um, infection results, results in, in them actually prescribing antibiotics and sending for the same, and sending for a TB test at the same time. So if actually GPs can be given access to affordable testing, uh, uh, things can be easier uh, for both the GPs and the clients because that will reduce pressure from the treat first and, and test later and to avoid also the diagnostic delays.
Um, thank you. I would like to actually acknowledge my uh, mentors, Jeremiah, Dr. Jeremiah, um, Dr. Amrita, Dr. Sizulu, my supervisors, Dr. Mshaba and Jody Bofa. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Zimasa, for that uh, presentation. Um, and thank you also for sticking to time. Um, we have had uh, the experiences uh, on the working with private, practice, private GPs in, um, in Durban, but we know that in South Africa, most of the care for TB is provided in the public sector. So to just maybe speak a little bit about the link between that, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jacob Creswell. He is the head of innovation of the innovations and grants team of the Stop TB Partnership, a global multi-stakeholder partnership that seeks to achieve a world without tuberculosis through facilitating, catalyzing, and coordinating the work of its partners. Uh, he's based in Geneva. Uh, he serves as a global expert on different aspects of improving tuberculosis case detection. Before he joined Stop TB, he worked for the WHO and also for the Centers for Disease Control in uh, Atlanta and also in Guatemala. So welcome to you, Jacob, and thank you for speaking to us about the importance of an intermediary. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moya, and, and, and thank you for the invitation to talk. I hope uh, people can, can hear me. Uh, and. As Dr. Moya said, Moya said, uh, I, I think this talk, I'm not going to talk about a study or, or, or data specifically, but about how we think about private sector engagement and the importance of uh, using intermediary organizations that hopefully will, will, will um, bridge a little bit the, the, the rest of the, uh, the session. So, sorry if I can, okay. Uh, a lot of um, what I will present is, is, is discussed uh, in uh, the public-private mix for TB prevention and care uh, roadmap document that, that a number of, of, of partners uh, and, and the PPM working group uh, have put together. A number of you might have, have been involved, um, but, uh, this is for, for those of you interested in, in, in you know, the bigger picture theory, um, this, is, this is a lot of, um, it has a, a very good summary of, of, of a lot of what uh, I'll be talking about. So I, I, I don't think I, I need to um, spend too much time on, on, on the background, but, but I, it is important, um, this, this idea of an intermediary agency uh, and and how we've we've gotten to to where we are. Um, if we go back, we've been talking about private sector engagement for for uh, over twenty years, and uh, the early strategies were really top down. They were TB programs going and saying, uh, engaging private sector um, providers, but saying you know. Will you or please or you must uh, do X, Y, and Z because it's part of the national uh, approach? And they had some success uh, with with the providers that they were engaged, but quickly there was a, a limitation to that, and uh, for reasons that that I'll, I'll explain briefly, our thinking has has evolved quite a bit, and and the the implementations and approaches have have evolved quite a bit. Um, but uh, I think what's important to say is that as uh, over the years, uh, there have been, um, there are now very large uh, interventions and approaches uh, with for private sector engagement uh, that are, are, are scaling nationally now uh, in, in some countries, especially India. Uh, and 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 we will continue to 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 evolve these uh, these approaches. Um, again, very briefly, why do people go and seek care in the private sector? They may have to pay a small fee, but they don't have to wait in in as long a line. They can go at night, in the morning. The hours are better. 
private sector care is, is much closer to people's homes and, and it's not just uh, money, but it's also time that, that people take into account. Um, sometimes they actually have to pay a user fee at a public facility as, as well. And there's a perception uh, that the quality of care uh, is, is better in, in many instances. Uh, we also know that last year, 40% of the people who developed TB were not notified to national TB programs at a, at a global level. And, and uh, certainly in South Africa has a, has a large gap uh, as well. Um, there are the, the, the largest gaps um, yeah, globally are, are generally in countries with, with large private sectors. We also know that people consult private providers first uh, for TB. We know that for many other diseases. Um, on the table below, it's, it's, a, it's a looking at, at uh, childhood diarrhea and cough or fever. Um, but it's not just, many times people think about the private sector in, in, in terms of people with, with funds, uh, with, with uh, income that they can pay. Uh, but even among the poorest uh, quintile, very high rates uh, of, of care seeking in the private sector first. So the, the, this, this gap uh, of the uh, of people that we miss that, that we know have TB, there's, there's, there's quite a bit that can be done. In, in the world. And um, we also, in terms, of, in terms of scaling what are many successful um, uh, private sector engagement projects, uh, the, what we have seen much more recently is that often they are led by a well-placed, strong, non-governmental organization that can act as an intermediary between private providers and the NTPs. And again, in India, this is the best uh, example. Uh, now, um, huge, huge uh, funding provided by Global Fund for, for this. Obviously, India has a, a massive private sector and, and different um, countries will have different setups in, in, in private sector, but, but this is, uh, these are, are um, gains that that are beginning to be made in in other places as well vietnam has had some very uh nice recently documented gains uh based on the the indian model and and uh, and, and other countries as well so there are a huge number of barriers uh and i probably don't have time to go through them all in any any kind of detail but Again, going back to what we were, what I was discussing before, historically, there's been a very Ministry of Health NTP focus. This has to be run by, by the, the, the National TB program. Uh, all of the funding uh, that, that in, in many countries uh, is provided by uh, donors, but also even uh, in, in uh, publicly funded uh, TB that is going to public sector, it's not going to the private sector. There's a huge or a, a real lack of understanding about how private healthcare markets work. There's lack of data on this. There's, uh, and there's certainly a lack of engagement uh, uh, with people who are working in the private sector, understanding all of the, the ways that uh, the economics of private sector care work. Um, again, entrenched approaches, driven by basically we, we continue to do what, what we're doing. Um, other things that, that, that are important, uh, I think, um, are that even among private sector providers, there's a huge variation. There's a lot of debate around which approaches, tests, regimens, uh, maybe the best ones to use. Um, and they're just, they're, they're many other uh, competing priorities for, for private providers to engage with the TB program, but also for TB programs that have to deal with MDR-TB and TB-HIV and, and uh, a huge host of other competing priorities. So um, th that has certainly been a, a constraint. I think uh, I don't have to go into um, uh, much on, on this slide. Two nice presentations uh, previously have, have highlighted this. Um, 
while there are always going to be concerns about quality of care in private and public facilities, um, there's a, a, a large body of evidence uh, that quality of care in, in, in the private sector uh, can, can definitely be improved. Uh, many different areas in terms of reg regimen selection, prescription habits, again, uh, things that have been, been presented already um, now, but which diagnostics to use. Um, uh, and certainly a big part is, is the follow-up. Treatment adherence, support, and, and reporting uh, is, a, is, a, is something that private sector just um, generally doesn't do uh, areas as well as we would like. <clears throat> But then there's competing priorities, right? TB programs are, as I've mentioned, they're generally not equipped to in, engage directly with especially large numbers of, of private providers. Uh, and broader public health concerns, program concerns, are not the main concern of, of private pr providers. I mentioned adherence, uh, uh, support for people with TB, uh, recording and reporting. It's time consuming, but it's needed. Uh, and that's, you know, TB programs have, have, have been great at collecting that information. Private providers generally uh, are, are not, that's not their focus. And the focus is really on, um, as uh, Angela presented, you know, providing relief and support to the, the person that is in front of them. Uh, and I've, again, I've mentioned NTPs have gaps in TB notifications, every country uh, and every, every country with a private sector, there are, there are gaps that, that need to be filled. And provide, private providers have their, they are, it's a business, they are making money, they have to make money to continue to provide that service. And, and those, the public and the private, there's always going to be some of that tension. But the, the, the way that, um, that, that we see really more and more successful models is that this intermediary agency can support and, and we can use this, idea of a value proposition, but there has to be tangible benefits for the, uh, the private provider as well as the, the TB program. And an intermediary organization with the, 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 the focus and the skills is, is a, a good example, and I think we'll, we'll hear about them, of, of if, is that providing access to, to the best diagnostics that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise, uh, free drugs for uh, patients uh, that that are that are being treated in the private sector, maybe some other kind of incentive schemes or 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 social protection schemes, and th that the idea is that these uh, that this then will have an impact on on notifications and improving uh, early diagnosis and better treatment. Uh, that that's that that's the hope. So. Trying to pull it all together, uh, there there has to be a benefit for both the private provider and the NTP, and often the this this intermediary agency is 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 really something that that is needed to to bridge that gap. Um, <clears throat> keeping keeping private providers interested in keeping their own their own patients who they see as as their patients. Uh, they need to have income. Uh, they have no time uh, for, sometimes they're seeing huge numbers of, of, of people, have no time for all of the reporting requirements that would be that you would see in the private sector. And the intermediary agency has a huge role uh, in, in that. And, 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 but engaging, uh, they, they're looking for that engagement and the recognition and the respect, respect to the community recognition from the, the TB program helps them get that, that business. And, and I think obviously the TB programs that we, 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 we were well aware of them, I, ideally getting more people onto treatment that have TB. Um, <clears throat> as intermediate agencies are, are working together, we can see quality of care, hopefully uh, improve better diagnostic practices, more people with uh, confirmed uh, uh, bacteriological confirmation. Um, and, 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 and the things that the system things, broader public health goals that, that are being reached. And, and just finally, last, last points, um, thinking about some of the policy considerations that often come up, uh, are there policy 
uh, are there legal barriers to uh, this engagement? Do the does does is there advocacy that is needed? Is there is there uh, engagement of of of, uh, of civil society to uh, and and technical agencies to think about uh, reforming laws that maybe don't allow private providers to to notify, to treat, uh, to diagnose? Facilitating that uh, it may be important. Um, is there more regulatory regulatory information that uh, regulatory uh, support that is needed, uh, oversight that is needed, especially around mandatory notification. And then uh, eventually, I, you know, the, the longer term uh, um, ideal with private sector engagement is that private sector is seen as just another uh, healthcare provider in the, the larger TB response. So being able to uh, reimburse uh, and uh, yeah, reimburse uh, private sector providers or, and or people with, uh, that are seeking care to ensure that, that access to, to care is, is, is better provided. So I think that is my last slide. Yes, uh, and thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob, uh, for that presentation. I'm sure that our panelists and others will have uh, some uh, reaction to that. We'll move on quickly to our next presenter. And our next presenter is Dr. Sipo Nyati. Dr. Nyati is the Director of Health Programs for Equity Innovations, where he designs programs that uh, focus on innovative technology-based solutions and the assistant grants applications. He previously led a clinical and diagnostic team in designing a solution that improved access to TB services and also to strengthen uh, clinical knowledge and experience in managing um, MDR-TB. He has worked as the USA TB director and also worked in other uh, programs. He graduated from the University of Cape Town. He also has a diploma in HIV AIDS management. Over to you, uh, Dr. Nyati. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. So um, again, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm so glad um, uh, Jacob went before me because I, I can skip quite a few. Because what I'm going to talk about really is um, a GP-centric model when implementing a public-private model around TBK. And the case study we're using is in Nelson Mandela Metro. Um, and we were funded by Stop TB Partnership under wave six. So I'll really kind of jump into it, just to say that, so Aquity Innovations is a not-for-profit public health organization. Um, that really focuses a lot on infectious diseases, but really trying to assist the government in public health responses for these emerging public health crises. So maybe just thinking around why public-private partnership, and I think a lot of the audience is familiar with this, but looking at the case study in Nelson Mandela Metro in the sub-district C area um, is, again, looking at the resources that are available. There's more than 180 private-private practitioners who are in the community versus the 50 primary healthcare facilities that are there. And we know that there's about 70% of doctors working in the private sector versus in the public health facility. Now, looking again at the kind of tools and diagnostic services available in the private sector and in the public sector, you'll see that South Africa is doing you know, really well. I mean, the first line um, diagnostic test for TB is a gene expert. We have access to expert ultra, and this is covered by the arrangement with Cephate, so they are paying about $9.8. Um, uh, they have access to LPA culture, access to x-rays as well. Um, TB treatment is free in the public health sector. There's heavy testing and management, which is also free. And there's quite an extensive community, um, community component or community linkage component in the public health facility and also access to decentralized drug resistant TB model. So there's a very extensive, um, I would argue, um, infrastructure around TB management. And you can see contrasted to the private sector, um, a lot of the costs are, are borne by the patient. So again, expert testing, 
is not subsidized, so the patient actually pays quite a high price. TB managed, is managed in the public sector, so the private practitioner will have to refer um, to the public sector. And there's always questions around then how does the, uh, the private practitioner know if the patient reached um, the public sector? And also access to community linkages is quite limited unless the GP actually manages that. Uh, drug risk and TBK is also managed in the uh, public sector as well. And reporting is, is really GP led. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. So I mentioned that again, this project was funded through TB Reach. We're doing wave six scale up. Um, so again, very thankful for that opportunity to try and see if this model will work. Just looking at the challenges with regards to TB in Nelson Mandela Metro, very typical of the situation in South Africa is we've got a high number of estimated TB cases. However, there's already along the cascade of care, quite a few losses um, that are experienced there. Um, one of the things you could see is we est there's an estimate of about 13,200 cases that are supposed to be notified, but we have about 10,000 that are being reported with a treatment success rate of about 80%. But if you look at those losses, you can already see that we're probably looking at about 40 to 50% of patients not accessing care. Okay. Now, to address this response, we looked at a GP-centric model where we identified um, a consortium of GPs um, who were then managed by ourselves, us acting as an interfacing agent. So we were uh, providing the capacity building, we were supporting them with the reporting, and also um, liaising with the district management team and the National Health Laboratory Services, just so that the different parties knew you know, how to refer, and we're also making sure that the reporting is, um, you know, is acceptable to the Department of Health, and also ensuring quality of care uh, in the private sector, which is frequently cited as a reason, you know, why um, TBK is, is not being done there. So in terms of our model itself, we had um, provided a community linkage component which was linked to on-site uh, sputum collection of presumptive cases. So we're also then providing contact management for patients that were identified in the private sector. So in terms of diagnostics, we had managed to negotiate with the district health management team, which was very supportive of um, the initiative, to link the private uh, uh, practitioners with the National Health Laboratory System. So they were then able to send their samples for expert as the first line diagnostic tool. And then they also then in turn had access to the electronic notification. So the GPs were able to check for their results. In terms of management, because now the GPs had already been trained and were receiving you know, refresher courses alongside on TB management, um, they would then have access to free TB medicines, which were, they were getting from that catchment public health facilities. Just to say, the catchment um, health, the GPs are actually located in the community. So they do have access to catchment health facilities. So we were just making sure that as the public health facility orders drugs, we then have a small component for the GPs, um, you know, to initiate patients on care. And then recording and reporting, we would keep a reporting a component at the GP practice, but we're then also reporting in the catchment health facility so that um, the notifications get reflected into the national database. So you could already see that there's quite a few opportunities of working with the private sector, just looking again at the case study in uh, Nelson Mandela. So first was next, uh, access to the next generation first line diagnostic tools, access to molecular resistance testing, free TB and HIV integrated services, and access to referral to decentralized services um, for drug-resistant tuberculosis. So um, we then also partnered with uh, Epcon, um, which is a company, which is a, a company that helps you actually develop this twin model where we're looking at, you know, what the program data looks like and trying to utilize that to come up with a hotspot map for the areas in which we were working in. The idea around that was then to be able to place our community healthcare workers accordingly. So when they do door-to-door -door campaigns and screening, we're actually looking at areas that will give us the maximum yield. 
So these community healthcare workers were then linked to each GP so that the GPs then would, you know, get a lot of patients to be diagnosed and managed. And really the hotspot mapping utilized a lot of the existing program data, but also utilizing data that we were collecting as we were doing, um, you know, screening in the community to further improve the accuracy. So this is also just to give you a sense of, you know, kind of how granular the, uh, the information we would get. So we'd actually be able to get at neighborhood level estimates of number needed to screen. And those estimates, we would then send our community health care workers to do the screening there to try and verify to see if indeed the number needed to screen was working. The nice thing about using AI is the more you do it, the more accurate it becomes. So this became quite an invaluable tool um, for ourselves, but also to the GP so that they're familiar with the kind of uh, prevalences they have in their um, surrounding areas. So just to come to some of the results we achieved, and I mean, I think what's important to note is this was actually now done during our COVID era, so January um, 2020 to March 2021. And we had very ambitious targets that were set, maybe ambitious because we knew that there's a very high um, incidence of TB in the area. But again, you can see in terms of um, community screening, quite a high number of uh, people were screened for TB um, with, uh, you know, with a presumption rate of about 10%, which is more or less what you see in the public health facilities as well. Quite a high number of those people were tested, and uh, I'll show you a graph that goes to that. But what's also important, um, what's also important is looking at the number of patients that were ultimately diagnosed, which is 1,640, which I would argue is, is quite a high number of cases to be identified and managed in the private sector utilizing this GP-centric model. Um, now, what I didn't write there is that is there was also 173 drug-resistant TB cases that were identified again in the setting. Um, in this setting. So again, the issues around looking at the care cascade in the private sector, you can already see that in terms of linkage to care, the number of patients, the proportion of patients that were presumptive that were eventually offered a test is quite high, you know, and the number then diagnosed with all forms of TB was about 9%. This is quite comparable again to the public sector, which tells you that there is a TB problem and there are patients in the private in the public sector that require to be initiated to care. And because uh, the times of treatment um, are quite convenient in the public sector, they managed to achieve quite a high number of patients um, being linked to care and being started. So we also then, because we had you know, quite finite funding, so it was quite possible to try and calculate again, cost of finding one patient. And this really came to about $498 which looking at some of the studies that I've tried to quote here, you would see that it's quite comparable to active case finding um, interventions that have been done in other parts of the world. And then also thinking around, you know, the additional benefit of the linkage to care and patients being managed in the private sector. But studies again, or at least a more detailed analysis is required to work out the cost effectiveness of this intervention. So um, my time is running out, but I will just move quickly to say we did see quite a lot of the challenges that are being experienced across the country. So rapidly changing communities, you know, there's a high growth of informal settlement, you know, really also finding sustainable funding for this um, GP centric model or at least sustainable funding to include the private practitioners. And what we would argue is the government is already spending a lot of money on community-based organizations and we need to find a way of including um, GPs that are already located in the communities and have these linkages to the community to start managing the patients um, and also utilization of technology so one managing the community healthcare workers so already knowing where they are screening how many people they are screening in order to make sure that they focus um, their interventions so my last slide is really just looking at the district commitment, and I'm sure the panelists will talk about this. Even as the project ended, there was commitment from the district to ensure that the private practitioners have access to treatment for the patients to complete um, their management, which is quite a great uh, commitment considering the interfacing agency being ourselves was no longer there. 
As a result of this engagement, the district is also working with their private practitioners to now do COVID, community COVID testing with TB screening. So this is really a great um, you know, step forward. There's also a pilot proposal that was submitted to Global Fund to expand this concept to Eshanzin in OR Tambo. So I think the benefits of these are being seen. Now, coming to NHI, which you know, South Africa has already adopted, um, there was an option of uh, GPs working in the public facilities or patients actually being seen in the private facilities. And the rates which we paid the GPs were aligned to the NHI um, regulation. So we would argue this is probably a, a sustainable model that can be integrated into you know, case finding activities for South Africa or any similar country. But with a few items that need to be borne. So we definitely need buy-in from the uh, district health management team so they appreciate or at least you know ma uh, make available gene expert testing make available treatment for the gps as well and also integrating hiv services and the referral pathway also buy in from the gp uh, practitioners they see these patients these are their patients so it would be nice for them to also then appreciate you know how important it is for them to be part of a public health response and i would argue they do see the value of you know, being involved in public health responses. An interfacing agency would then be quite critical in making sure that reporting is done. We know that in South Africa, I think the estimate is about 12% of patients are being seen in the private sector and they're not being reported. So again, getting those numbers in to get a more accurate um, reflection of how many patients are being managed in the country. And the last one is really your remuneration from the private practitioners. It is a business, so there has to be a remuneration component for them, or at the very least, a capitation model that works for them so that their businesses are sustainable, so that they become an integral part of a public health response to tuberculosis. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for, this for allowing me to present. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nyati, for that uh, interesting presentation. I will move quickly on to our final speaker before we get to the panel. We're trying to catch up with time. So we want to welcome Dr. Jody Boffa, who is a scientist with the National TB Think Tech Sec Secretariat at the Oram Institute. She's also a research fellow um, at the uh, University of KwaZulu-Natal. She's an epidemiologist, a community-based researcher with a focus on people-centered care for TB uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. She leads a TB rich funded study that connects clients of private providers in Etewini to free TB testing. Uh, welcome, Jody. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moyo. And, and thank you, everyone who went before me. You make my job a little bit easier. So, this is um, uh, the preliminary findings from the Connect TB study. Um, where we, uh, similar to Aquati, um, had some funding to look at uh, and developing an intervention in Atequini. All right, so, uh, so ours was a, um, a Wave 8 TB REACH funded intervention, uh, and we designed it not only to increase notifications, which is uh, generally the goal of TB REACH funding, um, but also to respond directly to the GP barriers that were highlighted um, by our first two speakers this evening. So we wanted to, our, our, our aims in addition to increasing notifications were to connect GP clients to free TB testing by a gene expert in a way um, that was low burden to the client and to the provider. We wanted to upskill GPs in terms of uh, how to uh, manage TB appropriately, especially if they were going to be managing it themselves. And we wanted to develop a model for telephonic adherence support for people with TB. So as I mentioned, this was conducted in Itaquini. It's a pilot study, so uh, not in the same phase as um, the information that Dr. Nyati was sharing. Um, and it will uh, complete, the intervention will complete uh, this year in March. So just to give an overview, a very brief overview, um, the intervention is, is run on the Vula smartphone application, which if you're not familiar with, um, is a Papier compliant uh, smartphone app that generally is used for referral uh, in the public sector. But we got them to develop a form specific to us that basically what we do is we provide um, through the Department of Health, 
um, we provide uh, student kits uh, to, to GPs directly who, who sign on to the project. We tried to target all providers in Ikasini. They screen all their patients using uh, a project-specific algorithm, which is quite uh, highly sensitive for TB. And um, when they submit this form with some very basic information, which I'll share in a moment, um, they, then one of our drivers will go to them, pick up the sample, bring it to the NHLS lab, um, where it is tested for free by our lab tech, um, tested by gene expert. They also split the sample. Um, so that we have some uh, sample left for reflex testing if necessary. And then that uh, result is shared to our project manager who then uh, notifies the doctor via the Vula app, uh, actually notifies the patient through an SMS that's generated uh, for free through the app. Um, so they can go directly to wherever they wanted to seek care with that information and their um, NHLS lab number. So the test doesn't need to be run and they can be in, um, put on treatment right away. Um, we, in theory, notify um, the District of Health so that we can make sure um, all the notifications are making it into here. And we also provide anyone diagnosed with TB with telephonic adherence support for the duration of their treatment. So this is a lot more detail of what we do, which I will send around in a shared document, but I won't go through it with you now. What I want to share with you is um, what, you know, where we've succeeded so far. So in AIM-1, we did uh, develop this very, very easy to use um, uh, form in Vula where uh, the doctor just puts in basic information about um, the client uh, and, and uh, this includes um, asking the, the client the preferred treatment location if they test TB positive. So then we know which clinic they want to be treated at. It might not be the clinic closest to the private GP, or they might even choose the private sector. They do have that option um, because some patients simply don't want to go uh, to the public sector. They started off in the public private sector for a reason. And then we also get them to um, enter the, the HIV status of the patient. When they click refer, that triggers us to come and pick up the sample. So um, we, out of, uh, of under 400 GPs in Etiquini, we managed to get 155 GPs to say, yes, we want to be, take part in this. We managed to get 120 of those GPs to, to train on the app and 61 of those GPs regularly engaged. So that's not too far off um, the expected average that um, other uh, TB reach projects have found in terms of engagement. However, we do want to boost the numbers of GPs using the application. And collectively, um, since May, we've received 471 specimens submitted for testing. We only had uh, three wasted samples, um, and we were able to correct um, the GPs who submitted uh, poor specimens, uh, and, and so every client was able to be tested. Of those 471, 90 clients were diagnosed with TB, 87 with risk-susceptible TB, and three risk resistant. Uh, the gene expert yield quite high, which uh, may be due to our algorithm, might also be due to just maybe under-testing in this population. Uh, and the culture yield, um, which we run on um, people with HIV who test gene expert negative, people with trace um, results in their gene expert, or people who um, are gene expert negative, HIV negative or unknown, and still symptomatic one week later, which we're also able to follow up directly with the patient um, via an SMS and a please call mechanism. Um, through that, we've only been able to garner an extra two people uh, with uh, TB that weren't already picked up by gene experts. So quite a low uh, yield for the, for the culture. So just to highlight um, some, of the, some of the wins um, from the Vula app itself, the chat function enables uh, the program, um, project manager to communicate directly with the GP uh, based on each client. So there's a separate chat function for each client. They can report on, um, you know, here, here are the test results, if the patient needs further testing, they can, they can give them the next step for testing. If the client wants to be referred, um, they can let them know what clinic they're going to. And if a referral letter is required for any complications, um, they can also oversee that. And as I mentioned, um, we do ask that uh, the doctor enters the HIV status and there is no option for, I forgot to ask the client. And I'll tell you why that's important. 
Uh, in the standardized patient study, uh, when patients with uh, very similar symptoms to what our uh, clients would arrive with uh, went to see GPs in the, in the same region, less than a quarter of the GPs even mentioned HIV in the interaction, although over 90% of them mentioned TB, so at, like we at least suspected it. So in, in a region with high HIV prevalence, less than a quarter were really asking about HIV. What we found by putting it into the app, 89% uh, of uh, the requests that come in have an HIV result attached to them. Um, we, we, uh, some of those uh, that we're missing are, are simply not because the doctor didn't ask, but because the client didn't want to test or didn't want to disclose. And we pick up an extra 5% of those through adherence support when people actually have TB. So this has been a big win for the, for the project. Another big win um, has been our telephonic adherence support. I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but we, we have trained um, uh, a team of adherence facilitators who are from the community. They speak Isu Zulu and English. Um, they're very... Um, they're very well trained in, in harm reduction approaches. So the and they can and and they have a lot of information, nuanced information, um, depending on whether the client uh, is taking chronic medication for HIV, etc. So I wanted to share one quote uh, from a client that did complete, uh, and we have story after story um, from clients that have given us feedback as well as doctors. But this one in particular, I thought was, was a nice one to share. The first day I spoke to Tabiso, I was feeling very sick and stressed. Note that the day before I was diagnosed with TB. For some time, I wanted to be alone, although deep inside, I knew I had to do something about my health. Tabiso's voice kept on ringing in my head. Thanks to him for being persistent with his checkup calls every month and availing himself whenever I needed him. I remember my first time going to a particular hospital when they wouldn't allow me to start my TB treatment after long waiting, Tabiso and the project intervened. I was immediately started on my TB treatment and the clinic even offered me a food parcel. She goes on to talk about the, the first days when she wanted to give up and it was the, the hardest time of her treatment journey and he, he took her through that and he even went the extra mile and got her sister tested for TB as well. If it wasn't for him, I wasn't going to make it through. So this has really been um, one thing we're particularly proud of uh, it, through the project itself. Um, although we haven't uh, picked up as much TB as we'd hoped, just simply from um, GPs, not picking up as much GPs as we'd hoped to get on. Um, we have um, overall, uh, our treatment completion rate um, is, is, is quite good considering where we're at in the project. Um, the number of patients on track to complete is also proportionally high. Um, I don't talk about uh, loss to follow up. I, I talk rather about uh, initiating complex clients because they, ha they aren't lost yet. We still, um, we still are in contact with them and trying to figure out ways um, to get them to complete their treatment and help them to understand the importance of taking their medication um, and, and, and overcoming the barriers that they're experience, experiencing, even when they might feel like they're better. In terms of not initiated patients, we've had four and we've had five patients who have died, two before diagnosis uh, and three during treatment. And just to point out, we have about a 50-50 spread of um, people who are uh, positive for HIV, which is about, which is pretty typical of the setting. So just to give a brief um, run through uh, of sort of a, how this fits into the cascade of care, about 6.7% of our clients uh, had initial loss to follow up, including death. 10% uh, in total uh, have been lost to follow up. And I put an asterisk here because again, we're still in contact with many of those clients and we're still trying to troubleshoot ways to get them um, connected to treatment. In particular, one of those groups, um, uh, and, and it might be very particular to the GP setting is um, people uh, who are from outside the country. So they either have language barriers or potentially they might be undocumented here and afraid to go to a public clinic. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways to engage with those clients and then assure them um, potentially find um, uh, interpreters uh, to help them understand um, their results and, and, and what's required and the fact that if they are undocumented, um, there are ways for them to seek treatment and care uh, without that um, putting their status in the country uh, into question. Um, in other outcomes, we, the mean time from diagnosis to treatment initiation among those that have initiated is uh, 5.8 days. Mean time from diagnosis to treatment is 27 weeks. 
And when you compare those, I don't have the district level data at hand. When you compare it to um, the public sector, it's, um, it, I, I suspect it's slightly better, but when you compare this to what may have happened in the private sector, um, these, these people would have been sent away without their sputum being collected. They would have had to go to a second site, uh, potentially gone uh, to do the test and then receive their follow-up and then access care. Um, I can guarantee you, um, the averages would have been a lot uh, higher than this if, if they didn't have this intervention. So the challenges we've experienced, well, I've mentioned one. We, we, we reached, um, we, we attempted to approach 384 uh, GPs, 165 consented. We lost a lot um, just strictly because they didn't think they had any, they didn't think they saw any patients with TB, which was quite alarming. Um, we, some of them, you know, the receptionist wouldn't sort of let us get through the door to explain um, what, what, uh, what exactly we were asking uh, the, the GP to do. Um, and, and we really did lose a significant proportion who were afraid of collecting sputum in their practice due to COVID. Um, so that was quite an interesting thing. But again, um, I think the, the more successes we can share, um, the more pickup we could potentially get. Coverage of non-gene expert tests was a problem. Um, as I mentioned, the Department of Health, the, um, the Provincial Department of Health um, did provide us with sputum kits and uh, um, paid for all the gene expert tests with the NHLS, but they were unable to cover um, culture and microscopy. Uh, so we did get a grant from the Gates Foundation to do that. But if we were looking to do this large scale, we'd have to think through how, how that could happen going forward. Uh, notifications uh, are still a big issue. When we look back to where our data was at at the end of Q4 and uh, the reflection of those numbers in tier.net, um, you can see that that we've um, that those clients aren't appearing there. Um, some of them might just be delayed, uh, even though um, you know only two of our clients opted to be treated privately. So these patients are were initiated in the public sector. They're not appearing there either due to delays or simply because they may have expected that that was up to the private provider to notify. Um, and we haven't found a way to overcome this yet, at least in tier.net, because um, the, the district can't enter any data themselves. They are not a clinic. So we are trying to get on as an organizational unit so that we can enter that data on behalf of um, all, all the patients diagnosed. Um, in the private sector, uh, we just haven't succeeded in winning with the district to getting the public paperwork filled out and continue that, continue on with that. Um, also, connecting privately managed clients and complex clients to free treatment has has also been a bit of a, a challenge for us and 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 something we need to to continue to work with the Department of Health on going forward. But the next steps for us: interventions about to complete, adherence support will continue for another six months. We're trying to figure out how to sustain these gains um, and keep the intervention going going forward. Um, the VUBA form um, that we that our project has paid to develop can be absolutely made freely available to the Department of Health to continue implementation. Um, we think this is a good model uh, to, to consider for integrating TB and HIV care into the NHI. And also we think our telephonic adherence support model is, is a great model uh, for either public or private sectors. Um, and so we, we, we hope to seek um, funding to continue uh, testing that or expanding that. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jody. And I'm very concerned that we're out of time, but let's see how far we get with the people who are here with us because we really want to hear from our panelists. So we'll move quickly to the panel and um, I think you saw from the invitation that we've got quite a distinguished list of panelists from the private sector, uh, from the province, and also from the Department of Health. What we would like to do, just to maximize time, we would like to get short uh, initial responses from uh, each of the panelists. I would like to start with uh, Professor Naidu and Dr. Tebele. If you could please uh, put your videos on, if that would be okay for you. And then we'll move on to Zinfe, and then we'll move on to Dr. Balfour, then to uh, Ms. Gozo and Van der Berg, and then to Prof. Chara Lombas and to Dr. Mkondo, and then we'll ask Dr. Mvusi to just wrap us up. And I think it will be important for us to hear from her as representing the Department of Health, because at the end of the day, I think they are the ones carrying the major burden around how TB works uh, in the country. So over to our panelists, I hope you can hear me and you can put your, your videos on if that's okay with you. Thank you. 
Uh, so I think I'll start, uh, Zulu. Um, thank you for inviting me. So just a few points. I think all presenters were, were uniform in, in their approach to what needs to happen going forward. We know that TB is both important and it's also common because in, in KZN, a study just published shows that TB prevalence is around 1,100 per 100,000 population. And that makes it a very, very common disease. But for some reason, we haven't roped in the pri private sector because we know a significant percentage of patients actually access the public sector. This could actually serve as a sounding board for the NHI because we've developed the concept of the contracting unit for primary care, which will allow GPs to link as primary care entities to link with local district hospitals. And maybe we should start this because it's obviously in the pipeline and this provides a great opportunity for people involved in NHI implementation to actually launch this project within the, within the private sector, bring GPs in and even start the whole process of accreditation of GP practices around, we could start it around TB. But I think what is important is the department makes access to diagnostics and treatment available at, at, at primary care level both in the private and public sector. It's already available in the public sector because that's really important so that the, the program can be upscaled because we've, we've known by community interventions that the biggest way, the best way of actually addressing TB issues is to actually take away the reservoirs that exist in the community. And the best way to do that is to obviously identify them and link them to care so that they can get appropriate treatment. And another key important area is obviously the holistic management of TB, because it's not just about diagnostics and therapeutics. It's also about making sure that there's additional support because TB is a socioeconomic disease and there needs to be a, a linkage in the multidisciplinary team in, in terms of in ensuring adherence and support occurs to those patients. So I think uh, there's a lot that can be done and there's great opportunity of using the TB campaign to actually uh, launch the NHI, especially in high burden provinces like KZN. Thanks. Uh, good evening. Let me greet everyone from uh, Aloche. Can I proceed? Yes, please proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for, for the meeting and the, the initiative at large. Uh, I am based in Nelson Mandela Bay. Uh, Dr. Nyati has reported most of the things that are happening here. I'm a general practitioner. Uh, we started with uh, managing TB as a small PPM in partnership with the Eastern Cape province uh, at district level. And then we had the visitors from the from, now, from, the, from the province as, as, as overseers of the program. There was a nice partnership uh, that started the whole thing with uh, good relations with NHLS. And uh, the initial plan was to have X-rays, was also to involve uh, the people who are managing uh, HIV. It was as difficult to manage TB without talking about HIV because those are terrible twins. So that was the initial plan in 2009. And then we proceeded, but we could only manage to move on with TB. The, the practices were twinned uh, with the clinics that are close by. So if, if, if there's a, in, in, in a sub-district C, the clinic next to the practice, that is where I get TB treatment in boxes that is, the, is then kept at the practice. And then all the steps that we collect and the reporting and so on. So that is in line with national, it is submitted through the clinic. So everything was uniform. But the advantage, like it is highlighted in most of the reports, I'm looking at the study that was done in Cape Town and also the report from the GP involvement in KZN. GPs in our side, we had a 99% success rate in terms of managing TB in all the patients that we managed to pick up as having TB. And another advantage, counting from 2009, as much as initially we were only two GP practices, then eventually in 2018, with involvement of more NGOs, we were 10. 
and we're looking to actually be more. Uh, if you look at the impact of the program, and it's very interesting to hear the other reports from the various parts of other provinces. The follow-up is quite successful with GPs because GPs have got good relations with their patients. That is experiential now. It's very rare that uh, you could lose follow-up of your TB patients as a GP. And also the flexibly working hours. We still at work even now, clinics have long closed. Even on weekends, some of us are working uh, on Saturdays. So patients have got more flexibility. They don't have to mix, miss work in order to pick up TB treatment. The, the South African TB policy was quite funny, uh, especially around 2006, because everyone diagnosed of TB. As a GP, you just had to write a letter and send them to the clinic. So we contributed in a way in terms of development of multi-drug resistant TB, because a lot of those patients were lost to follow up and they ended up not taking treatment well. And also the question of specialists, which remains unattended. Most specialists simply write scripts for TB treatment and there are no registers, there's nothing. That is still a hanging issue, which it can be well managed by GPs, because most of the patients that see specialists, they, are, they come from GPs and end up with GPs. So this is a good initiative that needs more resources to be planted in. But also we need to think along about what are we doing about HIV, because we cannot successfully manage TB while ignoring HIV. That is one thing I just want to highlight otherwise, in terms of numbers, we need to recruit more GPs and plant more resources so that every practice, if every practice as we approach NHI can be involved in detection, high level detection of TB, high index of suspicion, then less people will be prescribing antibiotics as it was reported in one of the studies because everyone will know that what actually made some GPs reluctant to involve themselves in the program was because there were no incentives. Secondly, they thought TB was going to be a burden and we're going to get TB. And yet our consulting rooms, the waiting rooms, there's a lot of TB there. And if you are trained to detect TB, your high index of suspicion will actually help you to pick up more TB cases than someone who is less suspicious. So we've done a lot of impact positively in terms of managing TB and reducing burden for the state, uh, especially in the Nelson Mandela region which is uh, quite burdened with TB. It's good that we've got uh, many NGOs that are queuing up to actually help the situation and involve more practices. Areas of improvement is to actually twin HIV in the program and access to X-rays. Uh, thank you so much for now. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tebele. Uh, we'll move on to Zinche. Thank you, Dr. Sizulu. My name is Zinfem and I am a TB survivor. It is very interesting to be part of uh, this platform as a TB survivor where I get to hear a uh, research on TB. Uh, I'll just be brief on my response uh, from drawing out on all the presentations and just say that I think maybe it would work to use these kinds of platforms to actually learn from each other's work on TB, where we can sort of get ideas on, on new ideas, new ideas, or maybe I would say new attitudes where we engage both public and private in treating, finding cases, and, and actually diagnosing people with TB. And I, I think it would also decrease the number of people who die of TB because we would learn from research that has been done where evidence is there to actually, so, so we know what is actually going on out there. I'll just be brief by saying that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zinclair, for being part of the panel. Our next panelist is Dr. Balfo. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, again, thanks to all the excellent presentations that we've had today. I'll start off by saying that we actually need to leverage on the lessons we have learned from COVID. For the first time in South Africa, we had to work together both public and private sector. 
And uh, I think that was a good, you know, um, example of how the NHI can work. And so um, we, we really have this opportunity to take that forward. I think the presentations we had were excellent in that they told us, you know, what the challenges were. The first ones, for instance, were focused more on the challenges in terms of the overuse of antibiotics, people not being investigated, you know, people uh, uh, being sent for tests, which of course meant you are taking now the pe person to go and queue, and that is a challenge and people not affording the test. And whilst I was listening to, you know, India and Bangladesh and all these other countries, they found a way around this. And I was thinking, oh no, but what about us? Then all these other solutions came up, which is already we've got the means and, and models, you know, for ensuring that there is collaboration with the private sector. And I think that was great because collaboration is key in TB. We cannot defeat TB if we are going to be working in our pockets, you know, public, private, and all other, uh, you know, uh, uh, separations that we can put up. So I definitely am a big supporter of utilizing TB as our next step. Now that we had COVID and we, uh, you know, collaborated with each other, public and private sector, let's see how we can use TB to collaborate. And that we've got already the models that were presented here. And uh, you know, the free TB tests in terms of the patient does not have to pay for the test. And uh, I think we have had enough examples of how that, that can be done. The free treatment, the training and auditing of GPs, and of course, ensuring that there is an incentive for, for the GPs. So I am in summary just saying that we have a great opportunity here to ensure that we take the lessons that are pilots currently, the models that were presented here, and we, we really uh, uh, upscale those as a country in a way, implementing, as someone also said before, you know, testing how this can work in an NHI model. Thank you, Chair. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Balfour. Um, by the way, I, I think, I hope I did say that you are representing the Sanak uh, private sector today. So thank you very much. Um, we are going to move on to the provincial and district leads. We'll start over with uh, Ms. Jackie Ngozo and immediately afterwards to Ms. Uh, Van der Berg. Over to you, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you so much, Chair, and um, thank you again to our presenters for um, brilliant sharing of uh, the innovations that are being tested. Um, really, I agree with the previous speakers. Um, the private-public partnership is the way to go. That's the way we can really try and improve population and service um, coverage, especially in this case, we're talking um, about the TPK. Um, I will agree COVID-19 has really taught us a lot in terms of um, these private-public partnerships, but there are also other models of care where in voluntary male medical circumcision, we've partnered with our general practitioner that is really working quite well. So I guess with our pilot in Eteguini, we just um, need to um, let the, the, the pilot finish and we can analyze uh, where the gaps are. But I will really recommend that when we implement this, we look at um, fully utilizing the public sector, existing community, Based services so that we don't lose any patients and we don't compromise any recording and reporting of patients uh, that are starting on, on treatment and also use the existing um, adherence or, or support systems that are already there um, just to make this uh, quite sustainable and um, maybe take the lessons to other districts as well but it is, this is um, a, an uploaded um, a intervention that will really 
help us to move forward as a province and as well as a country. We know the burden in KwaZulu Natal is so high, especially in Etegwini. So if we do things right, um, it actually moves the whole um, country. And, and thank you so much, uh, but we'll be looking at taking this forward as a province. Over to you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Jackie. Um, we handing over to Ms. Van der Berg. I hope she's still here. Yes, over to you, uh, Ms. Van der Berg. Thank you, and um, thank you to all the presenters, and thank you for the opportunity to share the Nelson Mandela Bay Health District um, experience with this public-private partnership that we had. Um, I'm going to be very brief in my response because Dr. Najoka said it all. But the lessons learned from our side, um, because I'm responsible for the HIV, AIDS and STI program in TB in the district. So the lessons learned was during the implementation of this project, there was an increased access to health services um, with GPs, especially for the uninsured population, because we have approximately 70% uninsured population in the metro, as well as for those people who are working, but not on a medical insurance. Um, Dr. Norjoko said it all pertaining to the clinic hours that we have, so I'm not going to go into that. And then from a data point of view, there was a notable increase in TB screening as well as TB cases that were confirmed. You heard from Dr. Nyati, because of this project, they have, they've identified 173 DRTB patients. Post implementation, uh, um, I think there needs to be a willingness to identify that TB is a problem and um, We've noticed also that TB is more prevalent in men, therefore there is a need for more flexible hours for them to access services. The, uh, one of the challenges I think that was faced by the GPs is the number of patients they had to manage. So um, um, one GP at one stage had more than 30 patients to manage. So therefore, firstly, Public-private partnerships are possible as demonstrated by both Jacob and Dr. Nyati's presentations, especially considering NHI implementation, but provided that resources are available and for it to work optimally, there needs to be constant engagement between partners. And secondly, for this model to be functional, the public sector then should have formal agreements with GPs and then finally, the services should be expanded to include HIV, COVID, non-communicable diseases, and not only TB. I think that was also said by one or two of the previous presenters. So that's from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we're now going to move on to the last three Panelists, if I can ask you, Prof. Bachara Lombas, just immediately you finish. Uh, Dr. Mkondo can take over, and after uh, Dr. Mkondo, Dr. Mvusi immediately takes over without my, my coming in, and then we can just conclude. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Moyo. Um, I just wanted to highlight one or two things that came up in the presentations. The, the one was on um, from um, Jacob Cresswell's presentation, said poor people do seek care private practitioners. And we have seen that um, studies from the National TB Prevalence Survey and the study we've done at Orem did show that although the number of people that have first sought care as a private practitioner was lower than expected, there are still around 10 to 20% of patients, even those diagnosed in the public health facilities that first went to a private practitioner and then went down the road um, you know, after a long while um, to the public facility and sought care there and was helped. So I think that just emphasizes the whole issue and why we have to really worry about this. Um, the second is the public health issues are not the main concern of private practitioners. And I agree that we have to learn from COVID, but I think that uh, one other lesson that we can learn from COVID or something that we can use is that 
the general public and private public private practitioners have all become a lot more aware of the importance of public health and infection control. And I think uh, people now understand much more how evidence is, is achieved, um, how one person's health affects the community. So I think it's a good time to try and implement some of these interventions. And then finally, just to say from the think, national TB think tank point of view, we have been um, looking at private public partnerships. It's one of the areas of, um, of focus of our service delivery group. And we have also been uh, working with Equity and the Connect TB project to understand what is then required in terms of additional work that can be supported and opportunities for scaling up these interventions. Thanks. Um, good evening, colleagues, and a big thank you to the presenters for their uh, insightful for the insightful information that they've shared. I hope that I'm audible. I think I'll just also highlight a few things. I think Dr. Moyo, this webinar is quite well placed in light of the World TB Day um, theme around investing to end TB and saving lives. We really can't talk investment without talking private sector. And as highlighted by Dr. Salome and some of the other presenters, we know that patients often, their first point of care is healthcare workers or rather um, points of service that are outside of the NTP, whether it's GPs, private nurses, even uh, traditional health practitioners. So we really do need to leverage on that. Um, I think Dr. Um, Jacob did highlight on um, the WHO PPM roadmap, so I won't really talk much to that, but just to notify participants that we'll be updating it soon, so just to look out for that. But one thing I do want to highlight is that South Africa does account for almost 3% of global missing cases, TB cases. And um, while we don't have maybe such a huge private sector in terms of um, health insurance, we do know that over 40% of health expenditure is in the private sector. So that's really something that we do need to leverage on um, and work hard to ensure that we do um, really account for those patients. So just three main points for me. One, I really think that by increasing and expanding on these PPM approaches, we really can ensure adherence to guidelines so ensure that these patients are actually managed optimally. Simple things like whether they're getting antibiotics and HIV tests, et cetera, those kinds of things can really be tightened um, up a bit. And like Uzimasa uh, mentioned, um, we'll, ensure, we'll be able to ensure that um, there's access to diagnostic and treatment resources, which is one barrier that um, GPs have highlighted. Um, and then from Dr. Nyati's presentation, it's quite clear that both the NTP and the private sector actually stand to benefit from these partnerships. So I do hope that we can leverage on those and we can really expand on them. Um, and most importantly, we'd actually be account for those patients that are being managed in the private sector that would have otherwise missed. So I think just briefly in closing, I'd like to say that I really do hope that this webinar is the start of a broader discussion around um, an expanded, a bold and innovative PPM roadmap specifically for South Africa. Um, and as previously mentioned by some of the panelists, COVID has really shown us that it's possible. So I do hope that we can leverage on that and that we can really strengthen um, PPM in the country. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you uh, once again to the organizers and the presenters uh, in this session. It was really uh, quite encouraging to see the work that's being done uh, in the private sector. And I think uh, Dr. Debelele reminded me of where we come from uh, in terms of uh, the PPM uh, projects that we've tried to initiate uh, in the different settings. And uh, I must say that uh, the one that was uh, actually a, a success in a way uh, was the uh, Nelson Mandela one uh, because of the commitment of the, of the doctors uh, in that area. And um, I think that's a key point and, and a lesson that we learned from the initial project. 
that there has to be that commitment uh, from the GPs themselves. And secondly, um, uh, the lesson that we also learned was that uh, there needs to be uh, incentives for the GPs, for the projects to be successful. And um, it was uh, actually with uh, the TB Rich project that we also saw that uh, incentives uh, do work, hence the success of the project that was presented by uh, Dr. Nyati. Um, I think um, uh, the issue around uh, uh, engagements as well at district level, there's been a lot of support from, from the, from the uh, districts in terms of ensuring that this is a success. Uh, but going forward, I think uh, our solution would be, you know, the NHI in terms of uh, engaging more um, uh, of GPs as part of the rollout process. But in trying to do that, we also need to um, expand this, which was the initial um, initiative in, in Nelson Mandela Metro, expand it to uh, private hospitals. We've had successes with the mining hospitals uh, in terms of uh, what, how the reporting you know, would happen, though there were challenges around access to um, reasonable uh, testing as well as the, the medication, <clears throat> because um, this is one of the challenges within the private sector that, uh, for example, experts cost quite a lot of money as it was indicated in Sipo's uh, presentation, but uh, even the treatment. So it becomes even for those patients that are medically insured, it is a problem for them to uh, continue with treatment and unless they have the money to pay out of pocket. And, uh, and therefore, uh, as we move on, we need, this is something that would probably be also addressed within, within the NHI and remains a challenge right now. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, I think uh, from, our si from my side is that we need to probably also engage um, uh, the hospitals, the private hospitals. And there are initiatives in most of the provinces where there is reporting already uh, on TB in, in, from these hospitals. Uh, and I think the other point of, of care that we've sort of uh, uh, ignored where patients do seek help when they develop symptoms are the pharmacists. Uh, I know in other countries, they have also included pharmacists where pharmacists are actually trained to screen and, and even refer. And if they have a nurse on site, that nurse would is also collect sputum and initiate treatment. And so that's another area that we need uh, to, to look at. Key with what I'm learning from the presentations is that um, yes, for the, for the Nelson Mandela project, uh, community health workers were part of, of this. And I agree with the point that we probably need to also look uh, in our scale up, look at how we utilize existing uh, community health workers who can also support the GPs in implementation going forward. And again, the other point was around um, uh, monitoring adherence remotely for those patients that uh, uh, need that, um, that need it. Um, and again, <clears throat> have the backup from, from counseling, which I think are, are interesting approaches to, to this. So um, I must say that um, uh, this has been encouraging from our side and we would probably uh, be engaging in terms of uh, some of the results going forward and uh, see how this can then be piloted widely or even incorporated into the NHI where this has already started. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, it was much appreciated. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mbusi, for, for wrapping us up. I think you've said it all. There's nothing more to say. Uh, we want to say thank you to our panelists, to our presenters, and to everybody who attended today. We apologize that we, we ran late, but thank you so much for your commitment uh, for staying up, uh, you know, up until the end. And, and we hope that this will be a useful, something that will be useful in the TV world uh, since we're all concerned and passionate about it. So on that note, we're bringing this webinar to a close. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone.